Sweet. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the seventh ever Marketing Meal webinar. Uh, and a record breaking one at that. We've had over 1,500 signups for today, which is freaking wicked, or as Mark would say, fucking wicked. Um, all the way from Manchester, all the way through to Nairobi, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and the reason why, and I don't pretend uh, anything else, is that we have the absolute pleasure of welcoming the legend that is Mark Ritson to speak with us today. Uh, Mark's almost a man that doesn't need any introduction, uh, but for the sake of prosperity, I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, Mark's been a columnist at Marketing Week for over a decade, a regular and world-class speaker, a consultant for some of the world's most interesting brands, and also a marketing professor gone completely rogue. Having recently stepped down from the Associate Professor role at Melbourne Business School to focus on his mini MBA program. Um, this is something I'm sure Mark will mention later on, um, but let me just say that it's the thing that it's the one course I really aspire to do one day. Um, he's got over 4,000 people on the course presently, which is just ridiculous. Um, but I just want to say, uh, if, if you're considering it, really do put your time and consideration behind this course. On a personal level, Mark's had a huge impact on me as a marketer, uh, both through his columns, but if I was to point to two specific pieces of work, then you should check out his uh, work on the 50 years of the Effie's uh, case studies. Uh, my favorite was the Tide Super Bowl ad analysis, and then uh, his talk on the contrary, delivered at the APG, APG Strategy Conference in 2018 is actually my favorite marketing talk of all time. Um, so wow, Joe. Yeah, I know, I know. It was a big deal. I freaking love that talk. I've watched it quite a few times. So uh, I really, if, if people need something to check out afterwards, go and check out that talk. It's amazing. Uh, the reason this session is relevant today is that we've all obviously seen a monumental shift in the world in the past few months. And while much of the conversation has been based in supporting each other and helping each other grow, I've seen relatively little in the way of analysis or even presentation on how companies should be approaching the situation beyond the now and the high level comments of the new normal. I've no doubt that by the end of this, we'll come out a little bit wiser on how to approach the C word. And uh, knowing Mark, uh, I am talking about coronavirus, uh, not the other C word. Um, I wanna say, a huge thanks to the sponsors uh, very quickly because even though I've mentioned them in, in the uh, email before this, and I will do afterwards, they are the reason why we're able to carry on doing what we're doing. Um, obviously, we're what, like seven, eight weeks into this right now. Um, but right at the beginning, they stood by our side and said, we're going to continue supporting you because not only do they believe in uh, supporting the community, um, but you know, they believe in everything that we're doing. So I just want to say thank you very much uh, to Pitch, Content Cal, Fiverr, Redgate, Cambridge Marketing College, Lidu, Brand, Further, Third Light, Bravo, and Human. Now there's one ask which I'll make, uh, which is if you get anything from this, uh, this session today, in the follow-up email, there's gonna be a link to a key individual in each of those companies. Just please do take the time to say hey to those folks and uh, say thank you very much for supporting us because it really does make a big difference. Um, today, we're gonna have a short presentation from Mark, but most importantly, we're gonna have the opportunity to take questions. So if you wiggle your mouse, you'll be able to see that there's a and a function down beneath. Uh, if you start getting your questions in straight away, um, then as soon as the presentation is finished, then we can start getting into questions and answers. So all that said, that was a four minute introduction. I'm the least interesting person on this call. So now I want to hand over and just say welcome to Mr. Mark Ritson. Thank you very much for being here. Hey, well, good. Uh, I guess good morning to you, Joe. It's evening here, so I'm not an alcoholic. Well, I might be an alcoholic, but it's <laughs> it's uh, well, it's five o'clock here, which is sort of legal drinking time down in Tasmania. So I'm yes. down in Oz um, uh, enjoying the the miserable winter weather but drinking an extremely good i must say uh west coast ipa which i strongly recommend if you come to tasby um which is which is really greasing the wheels at this point of the day <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> 
All right. So, so shall I do, shall I go through a few things or just talk or what? What's your preference, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. If, if you want to go through uh, talking through you, you few, few bits and pieces, I can see it. One question has already started to come through, so um, people can start asking. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I tell you what we'll do. We'll. I, I really. I'm genuinely more. <laughs> more interested in questions than than um that you get very bored with yourself doing these things as i'm sure you know joe you sort of get like you, you, it takes a while but you do eventually get really sick of your own your own uh perspective so i'll talk very briefly about coronavirus marketing and stuff and then we'll we'll hopefully have tons of questions and i'd encourage everyone to ask anything at all i'm game if you are and we can have a really indiscreet conversation about anything okay and i mean anything i've checked with joe and it's like all all channels are open let's go um i'll probably talk about what i'm gonna write my column on this week that might be the most interesting thing because i've just finished it and it'll come out probably late end of today uk time so i think i am uh i'm appalled i am british by the way some people don't realize i i'm married to an australian and she forced me at gunpoint to live in Australia, but I am a British citizen, not an Australian citizen. And I do spend quite a lot of time back home in Blighty. So, um, but anyway, I'm appalled at the state of government communications. Um, and I'm making a point in, in my column this week that I've stayed a long way away from, from the coronavirus, you know, ep epidemiology discussion that a lot of people have been talking about. So a lot of people in marketing are, sharing their wisdom about coronavirus and what's going on. And I really think we're completely out of our league here. You know, the Dunning-Kruger effect, where you have no idea what the fuck you're talking about, makes you think you know everything, is massively in play on LinkedIn all the time. So I've steadfastly tried to avoid that. But this topic's different, right? So the whole point right now is we are... It, it's a matter of hundreds of lives, probably thousands of lives that we communicate clearly over the next two or three months, what people should and shouldn't do. And it's just, let's be honest, not happening. And I am non-political. I come from a very working class background and a terrible comprehensive school, but I, I really have a, as little interest in labor as I do in the conservative party or indeed any other part. I've never voted in my life, I'm ashamed to say, but I just think they're all tossers. So I have no political interest at all um and look boris is the prime minister that's awesome i don't care you know but the point is and i don't want him to fail let me make that clear but the point is what i saw on sunday that talk he gave that was fucking terrible man terrible and it's terrible for a number of reasons um first of all it it, it just it just has no clarity so he's meant to say to people this is what's going to happen and this is what we want you to do and what I, what I was appalled by, and I watched it again this morning to make sure it wasn't just me, um, it's full of qualification and either ors. You know, he, he doesn't really have any certainty in any of the things he says. It wasn't even a roadmap. It was the first draft of a roadmap. What the fuck is that? You know, and he's got a COVID alert system, which is the combination of the R number and the number of people suffering from the coronavirus. That doesn't make sense because the R number is a number somewhere between one and approximately two normally. I mean, it can get up to seven or eight, but only if the world's going to end. If it's a zombie apocalypse. And the other numbers, obviously, hundreds of thousands. So adding those two numbers together makes no sense. And he doesn't know what either number is. He said in the talk, you know, the R number right now varies between 0 0.5 and 0 0.9. That's, that, that number is, is, is hundreds of thousands of lives. So I just thought it was appalling. And then this government message, I mean, I think the government's done quite well in the early days, you know, stay home. But this new message that they're now broadcasting about, um, what is it, stay crafty, save life. <laughs> anyway, whatever it is, whatever it is, it's like, what? What does it mean, right? It's stay alert. What for, right? You can't see it. Um, the next one is, do you remember, Joe? It's like manage the virus, isn't it? What is it? Uh, I don't know what the second one is. Stay alert. Stay alert. Um, Something. Manage, manage the virus. How? It's a fucking virus, not a football team. And then save lives. Well, yeah, okay, but how? 
And, and Nicola Sturgeon, who's, you know, I have an equally lack, lack of support for as well, but seems a relatively level-headed politician, said, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, there's no fucking way we're going to adopt that slogan. We're going to stick with stay home yeah. because at least people know what the fuck that means. So I was really appalled by it. And what I'm proposing in my column, which no one will pay any attention to, is we have, unfortunately, one of the highest levels of coronavirus infection in our country. But also, you know what we've got? We've got the world's best communications people. And surely, surely the people that are doing this communications should be taken out to a car park and quietly executed. And we can bring in a team of proper marketing comms professionals who can do the planning, do the creative and do the media because it, it is going to matter. And the irony of all of this is, you know, all that brand purpose wank where we're trying to save the world with chocolate digestives and, and, and coffee and moisturizer. It, it, it's all just non, you know, bravery. There's that new award for bravery. You know what I mean? Who are the bravest marketers? Fuck me. You know what I mean? A nurse. That's who's the bravest. A nurse. Any fucking nurse, right? It's not the director of marketing of fucking Sainsbury's. Do you know what I mean? Ooh, they're so brave. Fucking hell. Um, uh, but my point is, you know, at the end of the day, we, we really, really, really have to help out on this one thing we can do, which is comms. Like, I, I'm volunteering, like, Dave Trott and John Hegarty to form a new, like, super team um, to get in there and, and help because whoever's doing it at number 10, they're a Muppet. They're a total Muppet. I mean, it's a disgrace. And it's not like, no, it's like a point of view. Like, and I had a, famously many years ago, I got obsessed with the fact that when the London Olympics were going on in 2012, the, the mascot looked like a giant penis, yeah? And I went on a bit of a tirade for many, many months about the fact that it looked like a penis. And it was a bit stupid and funny in a point of view. This is not funny. This is serious shit. If we don't get the communications to the British public right, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to, to be... To, to save the lives we can save now, right? And coming out of coronavirus is much harder than, than going into it. And, and you, know, you know what's going to happen next. It, depending on where you work, there are different instructions. We're going to see, unfortunately, it will, it will blossom in certain areas over the next two years. And they'll have to lock down that particular area. Where I come from, which is the, the West Cumbria near the Lake District, it's a particularly virulent area for whatever reason. So they may well have to lock that area down and have different rules for that area. So we need a way of telling people, you know, what, what's going on. So uh, that's what my column's about this week. And I just think, I mean, I, again, I don't mind Boris that much. I think I like him more than the average, uh, the average voter. I, I find him quite interesting, really. Mm -hmm. But I just thought Sunday was appalling. And, you know, and it comes back, my final point is it comes back this idea of leadership. I'm sick to my back teeth of leadership experts who are politically correct, banging on about emotional, leadership is emotional intelligence and sensitivity. And it doesn't fuck any of those things. Leadership is making the right decision and getting every fucker to do what you want. And I'll give you a good example, right? And I'm sorry, it's very, very, what's the right word? Not, I mean, it's not, I don't know what the right word is. It's just not going to be popular with some people. I don't know if you're watching The Last Dance Joe at the moment on Netflix, right? Mm -hmm. I hate, I hate basketball. I lived in America for 10 years. I fucking hate basketball. I <laughs> traded the, my, the tickets. We had season tickets at the university I taught at for the NBA. And I traded them for booze and bags <laughs> and anything. Right? I never went. But I have to tell you, the dance on Netflix right now is the greatest fucking documentary I've ever seen because mm -hmm. Michael Jordan is astonishing. Not as an athlete. But that's a different thing. I knew that already. Not as a basketball player. He is hard the fuck core leadership. And if you've got to see like the, the way he bullies and smacks about and enthuses and inspires that team, of, of relatively average men to win another basketball title. And like he says, like he does, and he sits in that chair now, he's, you know, he's 50 odd and he's, he doesn't give a fuck. He's like, you, you know, the guy asks him, well, you know, people complain about you. And he said, 
You've never won anything. You don't know what it's like to win anything. I had to do that. That's the cost of leadership. So leadership for me is making the fucking decision. And I, look, I'm not a leader. First of all, Michael Jordan's a leader. I've never led anything. I'm a, I'm a lone gunman and always have been, right? I do not play well with others. But I do, I've worked for some great leaders and I've seen them lead in action. And what we're missing right now, and I don't give up on Boris. I don't want to give up on him. He is our prime minister. But what we need right now is clarity. And what we need are decisions. Mm -hmm. And we are clearly not going to get them. And normally it's like, oh, shit, we've got a crap government. It's going to cost us with many lives if we don't fix it quick. So, I, I mean, I'm writing it flippantly as the column, as I always, I suppose, do. But I genuinely feel like if you ask Dave Trott and Hegarty and, and the other people I name in the column to come to 10 Downing Street and sort it the fuck out, a, they would, and B, we would save hundreds of thousands of lives. It's it's that stuff. So I, I had a whole slide deck prepared on other shit, but let's just talk about that. It's far more worrying and, and important, I think. Anyway, Joe, that's it. That's my spiel over. Awesome. So there's a question actually that's that's rose to the top, and and so there's there's 68 questions that have already come in. So yeah, that's yeah. nine hours at my rate, man. <laughs> yeah. So folks. Um, there's there's like a thumbs up mechanism so if you're going through the questions and you see something you like give it a thumbs up because then it will rise to the top so the question that's right. come to the top so far is uh from ashley seager that says uh say the uk government was a marketing department of big brand uh how would you consult them what would improvements would you give to their strategy and tactics uh right now and um, yeah, it's a good question. And and really, I think it's about, I mean, there's a couple of things, right? Um, I, I, I wouldn't be, again, back to my point, I wouldn't be as bold to think I have any knowledge of politics or coronavirus. So I'd stick to what I and what everyone on this call knows about, which is how do we do marketing and communications? I think what's missing is a couple of things. Strategy is, 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 is sacrifice, is the cliche. But what you saw from Boris was hedging of lots of bets. Now, I get the idea. There's lots of uncertainty in front of him, and I feel his pain. But you've got to fucking manage that. And I think the first thing you would communicate to them is nail it the fuck down. You know, when John Kennedy talked about going to the moon, there was lots of uncertainty in front of him. But what he said was, we're going to go to the moon by the end of the decade, right? That's what was missing from, from, you know, Martin Luther King had a dream. He didn't have a number of different scenarios that he considered. You've got to make a fucking call. And, and he's, what, what Boris is not doing here is making a call. So the first thing you'd communicate is you have to make a call now, Boris. What are we going to do? And what are, the, what are the different steps? Right now, remember, we have three steps to come out of coronavirus and five alert levels and one uh, measurement system with two measures. It's, it's not fucking clear to anyone. So I think making a choice and saying, ding, ding, ding. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I would really, really encourage him to speak to communication professionals. And it's not me, by the way. I leave a client when the, when the agency boys and girls turn up. It's the last thing I'm involved in. But I, I appreciate them. We finish the strategy and then in come the agency and they go and do their beautiful stuff. We need them now. We need them now. So my advice is, look, strategy is, it, it's not being emotive and looking at the camera with a big, you know, with these big blonde hair and going, we are, oh, yes, it's very tricky. Mm -hmm. That's not what leadership is. Leadership is making a fucking hard call and telling everyone, and now we're going to go and do it. And, and he's lacking so far, though I haven't lost hope in it. No. And then, yeah, the second thing is comms. We need comms, man. We need Google and Facebook and the best account planners in the country who are the best in the world to get to 10 Downing Street and go, right, let's work out what your strategy needs to be in consumer terms. We understand you want to you know, flatten the curve and blah, 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 but let's work it out in consumer terms and give it to us. We'll sort it. A good agency comes in and goes, okay, okay, guys, we got it. Now, give it to us. We'll sort it for you. And that that's that's what that's what's missing right now. Clarity on strategic brief and decent professionals who know what they're doing. That that poster we're all seeing with stay alert and you know manage the virus and save lives. That looks like it's been done by a bunch of bloody idiots from a comprehensive school in the remedial class. And I know I used to be in that class. Um, 
it looks like, you know, it's an art project from year 12. The ones that have disciplinary problems. Do you know what I mean? What is going on? So that's, that would be my consulting advice. Okay, cool. Um, and actually, this, this next question follows on quite nicely because the flip side is, what brands have you seen stand out and who have managed the COVID crisis best from a marketing perspective? Yeah, I, um, I think there's, there's a few that are doing well. I, the one I would like to focus on is P&G. So if you know about brand management, you, you have a special soft spot for P&G because uh, Neil McElroy, who invented brand management in 1931, was a, a P&G guy, you know. So they literally invented brand management, you know. And um, they are still the best of us when they do their job well. Gillette in the recent years is, you know, a sad old story, but generally they're just the best and they're still the best. And so I love very much the idea that as we face this coronavirus recession, P&G just went, right, we don't know much about coronavirus. We know a shitload about recessions. We know how this works. We're going to double down our investment, maintain investment in the key categories, and we'll grow market share now as everyone else pulls back and we'll keep it going into the next phase. And that's a PNG playbook that's literally 100 years old. And I love the fact they're still doing it. And their CFO was talking last week going, this isn't the time to pull back. Quite the opposite. It's a time to double down. So I, I love the idea that there are some people still looking at good data and making the decisions. And I love the fact that it's PNG who are the oldest and the best of us. So yeah, I'd probably say P&G is my fave. Um, there's a guy I wrote an article about last week, uh, Jim, who runs a, a farm called Triple Nine Farms in New Zealand. And it's an old, it's a cooperative owned by New Zealand farmers. And they have the, a proper old Aberdeen Angus stock. And they've been working for about three years to produce this restaurant distribution business to supply incredibly incredible quality, environmentally raised animal standards off the charts beef. And they were planning to open it on April the 1st. And of course, you know, every restaurant shut down and New Zealand was in a very, a very strong lockdown. And so Jim was just fucked. And so he's pivoted the business to meat boxes to um, uh, consumers. So he's gone from B to B to B to C. He's worked out how to do distribution, change pricing, change product. He's using social media for communications. Right. And the guy's going to survive, probably. And he's coming out of it. And what's interesting about it is if he, I mean, there's a lot of money involved. If he comes out of it alive, he comes out with some new business streams that he wasn't, didn't have when he went in. Sure. You know, because if you, if you take an animal like, a, like an Aberdeen Angus cow, and you cut it down, only about 20% of it is prime cuts. So he's got to find out what to do with the 80% now. So he's doing processed meals and everything else. And it, it's opened some doorways that he wasn't aware of. So there is that idea that the pressure on the coal creates the diamond. Mm -hmm. It'll kill nine out of 10 businesses, but one out of 10 will get stronger. For sure. So actually on your point of P&G doubling down, um, there's a question here from James who says uh, companies are dropping their pre-planned campaigns and freezing budgets due to COVID instead of adapting their messages uh, like the farmer. So how can yeah. marketers convince management that marketing is now more important than ever? Uh, there's a couple, you've got to look to history. So every manager who's under 40 is, is going to be going through this for the first time. I'm 50, right? So I, I went through the GFC, uh, fuck, it's 12, 13 years ago now. 12 years ago, I, was re I wasn't senior, but I was relatively senior. So I saw the GFC hit. And it was really interesting because at the time, it was really the rise of China. And the companies I was, I was working with, they all really, these Chinese men and women came along and they were just making so much money for, for the companies I work with globally. And then when the GFC hit, they, they just almost without exception, lost their shit and were useless, like totally fucking useless. There was a guy called Magic Mike who worked for one of the big cosmetics companies I worked for, who was literally regarded as a genius. And the minute the recession hit, he was just like, it was like having a blancmange. He had no idea what to do. And so the answer with this uh, approaching recession is to show senior management previous data from previous recessions 
and it's always the same. And I mean it, even Byron Sharp would fucking go along with it, right? <laughs> it's not only that we've got a hundred data points all doing showing the same thing. There aren't any aberrant, what we call aberrant cases that contradict it. So what happens in a recession is if you, I mean, look, increasing your budget is a PNG play. No one else is going to do that. Let's be realistic. Maintaining your ad campaign and your advertising spend as everybody else pulls back, gives you a bigger relative share of voice. You get a market share from that, that you retain at the end of the recession when everyone else starts spending the same as you. That's it in a nutshell. Sure. How do we know this? We know this because everyone studied it and, and, and looked at coming in and coming out. So if you want to have a look at some bullets to shoot at your senior management, Nitin Noria, there's a name for you, is the Dean of Harvard Business School. And he, had a, he has a paper in HBR, which is free, which is called something American like spanking or bouncing out of a recession. If you look at Nitin Noria and spanking, it'll probably be all right. You'll get something. Anyway, he's written a great HBR. It's bouncing or blasting out of a recession, something like that. He studied about 4,000 firms, and he found that about 9% of them come out stronger than the ones that went in. And one of their hallmarks is they cut elsewhere to maintain marketing. So I'd cite that. And then I did a talk about a month ago online when it all started called Marketing in the Age of the Coronavirus. I list a whole bunch of studies that you can look up that show this same effect. I went into great detail. I mean, I, I can go into it now, Joe, if you want. We should probably stay on questions, right? But let me do it in three seconds. You do it in three seconds. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, let's do a three-second review. And if you if you screenshot this data, dudes and dudesses, you'll get... So here's the proof. Ready? Uh, rah, uh, uh. So here's Roland Vale in Harvard Business Review. I mean, it's from 1920, so you might not want to use it. But basically, there was a massive recession between 1920 and about 19, ah, 2021, really. The firms that increased advertising came bursting out the chops. Now, I don't propose you tell your boss about data from 1923. He's going to or she's going to throw shit at you. So let's let's jump forward. The Carter recession of 74, 75. Meldrum and Fusemith, available free if you Google the research with PDF. There was a recession here, 74, 75. So they looked at those that didn't cut their budgets versus those that cut both years or one of the two years. Look at the fucking difference. 77, which is a boom year, they're doing, you know, index-wise about 25, 30% more, even though these guys are now spending more. Uh, the great Stephen King and Alex Beale, this date is also available. Look at the effect of companies that maintained or increased spending versus those that cut spending during the 1990-91 recession. Again, these guys in black are spending as much once we come out of the recession. It's just they're not doing it during. And then Peter Field, God, Peter Field. Peter Field's data for the LinkedIn B2B Institute looking at the GFC 10 years ago, Companies that either maintained or reduced their ESOV, their excess share of voice, they do grow a bit because a lot of people go out of business. Up to 8%, you get about a 1.4%. But the goal here is having an excess share of voice of more than eight points gives you nearly 5% market share gain for each year of the session lasts. So the, you know, my, my suggestion is always go with go with history we don't know much about covid and what it's like no one can guess what's going to happen you know fuck loads about recessions it's going to be the same recession my bet is it's a big fucker yeah it's a big fucker that's coming down the pipe we'll do one anyway so i don't think we're bouncing out of this and and although the 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 um look i shouldn't say any more i'm not an economist and i have no fucking clue what i'm talking about I smell a deep recession, but my dad, who's a moron, might have a better idea than me. Sweet. So there's a question here from uh, Nicolette, which kind of relates to this um, in a slightly different slant to it, though. Um, so you gave a great presentation uh, for Marketing Week the other day. Um, and I think at the end of it, you, you kind of sort of said that people would likely return back to where they were before in the, in the long term. So do you still hold that view 
you know, we're what, six, seven weeks on from from oh yeah 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 totally it's very easy to lose your shit in a crisis again back to michael jordan here's what's going to happen joe and again i have no data but neither do any of the fuckwits who are writing that media marketing shopping brands life work is going to change forever they're fucking wrong and i'm fucking right you wait and see yeah (laughs) what's going to happen is the consumer is going to snap back straight away to previous existence they're going to go to the pub. They're going to go to the supermarket, not buy their groceries online. Now, a couple of caveats. If, if structurally we can't do what we used to do, like fly to New York, clearly that's going to change. But that's a structural change, not a consumer change. And equally clearly, if we're already on a change, for example, the shift to subscription um, SVOD TV, we're, we're going to resort back to that curve. It's not that we're going to go back to how it was nine months ago. But with those caveats, you wait and watch. We know about consumers. Again, if you study history, they go back to normal. You know, um, I, I talked about Bill Burnback, the great ad man, talked about the unchanging man. You know, even back in the 50s and 60s, they're all talking about how man was changing in the 60s and all that. Consumers don't change that quickly. Um, Jeff Immelt, uh, not Jeff Immelt, uh, Jeff Bezos from Amazon says, look, everyone keeps asking me about What's changing? And that's not the interesting question. The interesting question is what doesn't change because you can build a business around it. And so I think, yeah, I I fully anticipate it's going to be a long period of change because coronavirus isn't going to go away overnight. But we will snap back. Uh, Carnival Cruise Lines opened up their cruise business this morning and their uh, order taking was 600% up. Great. consumers are fucking morons they're not fucking ready to go oh i've changed everything right uh, and unfortunately my message is not interesting every ass hat in marketing is right you know oh this is going to change that's going to change everything's going to change it's a very boring message to say no it's fucking not it's going to be the same as it was before we're not going to get more environmentally aware for fuck's sake we're not going to treat animals better we're not going to be nicer to each other it's all going to disappear like a, like a fucking Monday morning after a big weekend on the piss. We go back to normal. And that may not be good news, but it's the reality of consumers. They're mentally and physically lazy and ha- habit and heuristic kicks in. And everyone right now is in a different space. But the, when the space returns to normal, my, my words, and it might be two years, to be fair, wait and see and watch. Everyone's back at the bookies. Everyone's down the pub on a Friday. Everyone's doing inappropriate things. Everyone's washing their hands for two seconds at best. Mark my words. We snap back eventually. So interesting. It is good to hear that perspective. So switching gears. It might not be right, my Joe. It might be fucking wrong, but I'm pretty fucking sure. I'm pretty fucking sure it's not. <laughs> there was a um, there was a queue uh, back to my village, so about three miles long to, to the local tip. Of the local dump. Uh, <laughs> there um, you go. And Maccas in New Zealand, they opened up Maccas for the first time in uh, in like six weeks. It's fucking people were like sort of shooting each other to get a Big Mac. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just it. you wait and see, wait and see. Hundred percent. So switching gears a bit. There's quite a few questions coming in on uh, preparing for redundancy and marketing books yeah. and, and that sort of stuff. So. We'll start with the redundancy stuff. So there's a lot of people furloughed or losing their jobs right now. Uh, How would you, or let's, let's switch the question a bit. How would you personally, if you were in that situation, be spending your time right now um, to sort of prepare for the next sort of five years, I guess, five, 10 years. Yeah. I I mean, if you allow me to speculate, I do think it's a big one at the back end of this. And that's more, I mean, I don't want to downplay coronavirus because it's, it's killed so many people and it's so awful, but I think the recession and the economic impact is, is just as severe and maybe more enduring. So I think in marketing, it comes down to a couple of things. I really think you have to have a hard consideration now about career paths, about businesses that are in, a better post coronavirus situation and ones that are not, you know what I mean? And that should be a variable in your career search. Next thing I'd say is, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been a professor and a consultant that doesn't make me an expert in the job market, but I've, I've taught about 
we're getting close to 50,000 people now. And a lot of them I've walked through career stuff and then watched and seen what happened. And so the couple of advice pieces I give to marketers looking for job changes. Number one, it's a purchase funnel. Um, I get a lot of, a lot of marketers will say to me, look, I'm really interested in working for X company or, you know, I really want to work in that company. What is your advice? And my advice is fucking apply. Yeah. If you actually run the numbers, even in a non-recession purchase funnel, you need 50 to hundred applications to get two job offers, one of which you want. So the first thing you do is, you know, when we, and I'm not making light of it. I feel for the people in this situation, your full-time job, if you're made on employment or on furlough is, you need to get between five and 10 job applications off per day for the jobs that you want. And, and my other point is you never know, you never know who you want to work for looking at the job ad, right? Especially in marketing where brand manager can mean one short of the CMO or an events manager that gets free booze. It, you can't tell. Mm. And how the companies look from a consumer point of view bears no resemblance to how they are from a marketing point of view. I always remember I applied to Boston. I mean, again, it's not the same for other people, but I applied to Boston University when I finished my PhD to become a, an assistant professor at BU. And I really fancied it. You know, I like Boston. And I got dinged. And it's a pretty fucking average school. But Harvard made me an offer. You know what I mean? Mm. I remember thinking at the time, that makes no fucking sense. Mm. It does make sense because there's no linearity. Just apply, right? And the number of marketers said to me, oh, I'd love to work for Apple. Um, but I wonder whether I'm like, apply, or just to fucking apply, apply, you know what I mean? And then the next thing, forget about the application. Don't sit there going, I wonder if they've read it. I haven't heard back from them yet. And why haven't I heard back? Apply, apply, apply. It's a purchase funnel. Mm -hmm. And when you do your interview, it's you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. When you get to a senior level, fuck you, you, you know, it's a two way thing. Do that early in your career, you know, and, and interview them then. And the final point out uh, recommendation for careers is you can always jump sideways. It, a lot of, a lot of the marketers I talk to want to be brand managers and they're working in comms or they're working in general marketing or even general management. The best way to, you need two years to tick a box on all the HR morons um, forms. So the best way to do is to move sideways, probably for less money, Get a brand manager role within the company you're working at, probably working for people that you, you know, you don't like, but get the two years in. You don't leave until two years are up or you look, your resume looks, looks shit. You, you tick the box. If you're a brand manager for two years, you can go off and do many other things. And this might be the time to put your head down, maybe not make any more bucks, but, but tick the box of the two years so that when the, the economy picks up, you're an experienced brand manager. Mm -hmm. It's almost the same theory as, as what you're proposing for, for marketing departments in general, really, you know, sort of that doubling down on, on the brand roles and, and sort of doing yeah. that. Way. Yeah. Um, and, and how about resources and courses? So Jake uh, specifically here has asked about uh, business or marketing related books, but I'd open that out to courses and, and resources too. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm, I hate to be such a book Nazi, but I really don't think books are the future. And the reason I say that is I grew up in marketing in the 80s and we did have a couple of big seminal books. You know, Arca was writing brand management and Kotler was writing marketing management and then Keller came along. I look at these books now and they're just fucking terrible. And they're terrible because they've just been lazily added to. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like, you know, like a fucking trifle where we just shove more and more shit in to try and make it taste better. It's just not, it's, they're terrible books. I don't think there's any books that are going to bring you on. And I'd say to you that my uh, the three recommendations I'd give you, I, I really think LinkedIn is the shits, right? Because I used LinkedIn because I had so many students and it was just a good way of managing them and they needed stuff in the future and staying in touch. Then I discovered that it was a really good way to, to get my stuff out there. You know, when you when I was an, an early academic, you know, if any manager read anything I wrote, I was like, you know, aroused. <laughs> now I get fucking a million views on a post, you know, and it's like, you know, awesome. Yeah. But the, the yeah. best thing about LinkedIn of all is if you choose your contacts and who you follow surreptitiously, what you get is really, really good feed. Now, I, and I'm saying, like, if you get, you know, idiots for anyone who follows Gary, Gary V or posts a video of someone giving an inspirational talk 
or poppies and all that shit. I instantly fucking kill them, right? I just take them out of my feed. And I edit it because it's worth it. Because then what you get are quality marketers posting quality stuff that they've seen. And that's my favorite place, yeah? I would encourage everyone to come and do mini MBA. Not just because it's, you know, fucking making me zillions and that's obviously important. But the main reason to do mini MBA is it's better than anything else. Our net promoter score is plus 75. Um, and we worship our marketers that come on the program. So, you know, I'd put, I'd put the marketing course and the brand course against any of the top 10 business schools. You take my mini MBA in brand management, it's going to cost you 1,200 quid. It's a lot of money. And it's 12 weeks of your time, part-time. It's going to annihilate Harvard's brand management course. It's going to annihilate London Business School's brand management course in terms of quality, applicability. And I know that because I, I know who teaches those courses and they're fine academics. They're just not as good as me and they don't know as much. So, you know, and it's going to cost you five grand as part of a hundred grand degree. So I, I would welcome you on our program. September is the next one. Mm -hmm. um, what else would I suggest? Um, I, I think LinkedIn for me and, and, and culturing a, a good LinkedIn feed, it sounds obvious, but I think people treat LinkedIn like it's a connection factory. I find it much more interesting as a source of real insight from people who, who I really respect, you know? For sure. I, I think, you know, LinkedIn's time to shine really is now. Um, it has been for the past couple of years. I've, I've been quite surprised actually how they haven't seemed to do the same as what uh, Facebook did, you know, kill reach in yeah. some sort of way and, and stuff. Like, I guess the model no, is... The, there's a reason for it, Joe. I've worked with that team in New York. I really like them. They're almost too nice. So there's two things right. about the LinkedIn team. They're really not fucking killers, which I kind of, it frustrates me, but I love about them. They're, they're mm -hmm. Most of the people I've met are just genuinely interested in the platform, mm -hmm. not in making money. Right. And second, they're making so much money anyway, they don't have to worry, you know? Nice. That's really interesting. Um, right, guys, there's 90, there's 116 open questions. So, like, please thumbs up because we want to get the best ones to the top. So uh, we're just going to keep on working through. But um, so there's actually on, on the idea of the course here, um, the top question right now is what's the difference between the mini MBA and the CIM course? So uh, look, whether... we get a lot of we get a lot of people from CIM up to level six doing the course. And we ask them, um, which is better? And it's not CIM. Uh, we're partners with them. Um, uh, and they're a great organization. I think what they do is fantastic. The brand course is certified with CIM. But yeah, I mean, I, you'd have to, it's a conversation with the CIM. I'm sure they've got really good um, uh, data as well on how much, I mean, we, Again, I don't want to turn this into a sales mission, Joe. We should talk about other things. But <laughs> the people that do my course will tell you it changes their lives and it, it gives them confidence. 95% of the people that do the mini MBA say it makes them a better marketer straight away. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I'm sure the CIM have good data too. I just don't think it's as good as that. We'd stand it up against, never mind the CIM, we'd stand it up against Harvard. So it's a great course because of what it does for our, our students, our marketers. Um, and I think there's a good fit with CIM, but I think from what, anyway, from what our students have said, they've done both. We're more applied and we're more, it's more conveniently delivered. Yeah. So but CIM's great. Good. Sweet. And that, that certainly wasn't positioned in a way which uh, was supposed to dump on <laughs> the CIM or anything like no, that. No, no, we don't want to, the <laughs> yeah. CIM are very important. They do a great job. And we are, again, we're, we've, our brand course is affiliated with them, yeah. but you know, what can I tell you? No, good. Um, sweet. So I reckon we've got like 15 minutes or so. So um, we make these rapid fire questions and we literally work from the top. So folks, right. you've, you've got to uh, give it the thumbs up and get your questions to the top if you want them answered. Uh, so Ashley has asked, do you think fear is motivating a lot of short term choices or do you think modern marketing is being exposed as to what it's become more of the communications department that's all tactics and no strategy? Yeah, it's the latter. I think we were always short term, even when times were good. So it's not fear. It's a nice idea. Marketing is short term by definition because it's it's stupidly short term. So unfortunately, yeah, I just think it's, you know, it, it takes two years, generally speaking, to get your full effect from the long of it from brand building. 
So pulling your advertising because there isn't any short term, you know, boost at the moment doesn't make sense in that light. You might want to reduce it. But yeah, it's we, are, we were short term when times were good. So the short termism is definitely the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's be clear, Joe, the reason why you want to spend 50 or 60 percent of your money on long term brand building is because it makes you more money in the long and the short. It's just that people aren't good enough to realize it. Mm -hmm. ROI is the stupidest fucking variable in the history of marketing because ROI teaches you to go short rather than see the value of long and short. It's the oldest story in the world, but one that we are not succeeding to communicate. No, and, and that communication piece, it seems like that's something that we all struggle on. I mean, marketers are terrible at marketing marketing. So yeah. have, have you, what's the best example you've seen of folks sort of getting around that? Is it just a, a trust thing or uh, an understanding? No, I, Management or... I think you need to you need two things. You first of all need mark. I mean, let's not blame the CFOs and the C-suite. There's a lot that goes on in marketing. Yeah. It's because marketers are shit. Let's be very clear. I haven't met many. I don't know a lot of CFOs, but I haven't met many bad ones on my travels. It's just that they've had a whole bunch of marketing assets to deal with. Mm -hmm. This nonsense about let's get marketers into the boardroom. Why? Mm -hmm. When we get them there, they just make a mess on the fucking carpet. You know, everyone else goes. Who's that but Dumbo over there? They're not capable. They don't understand strategy. They don't understand gross profit. They're a, they're, they're a disgrace, you know? Why are we getting rid of the CMO position? It's not some philosophical debate. It's because when we give the board a CMO, they're a fucking asshat. That's why. No one wants to say it, but it's true. They're not as good. So we need two things. We need good marketers who understand the broader corporate function, mm -hmm. Um and second, I think we need cooperation between the silos. If you look at, what's a good example? One of the FE cases I've done, and we, you can look it up, they're all free online. One of the FE cases I did uh, was looking at Lidl, the German supermarket, over-investing in advertising in order to grow their share. And it's a great example of ESOV. And it's, if you search for Lidl and Ritzen and ESOV, you can get it on YouTube. And... Um, that came about because the CFO and the CMO sat down and went, right, what are we going to do? How do we do this? To, you know, how do we work? And the old joke, as if we work for the same company. Mm -hmm. And they went through ESOV and they worked it out. And you know what? It It's worked. So, yeah, cooperation and marketers who know a bit more about first about marketing and then about the firm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. So, Tom Hemmings, your top five marketers to follow on LinkedIn. Uh, who would I follow that's really good? Uh, oh, you got me on the spot now. I've got to think yeah. rather than refer to it. I would tell you that Dave Trott remains a great source of inspiration. I would tell you that, um, oh, hang on, I'll have, to, I'll have to look it up. Hang on, hang on. My brain is not good at that. So, <laughs> well, should we go to the next one and give you time to consider? Do that while I put in my LinkedIn because the, the whole point about LinkedIn is I can read something interesting <laughs> and then go, oh, that was interesting. You know what I mean? Who wrote that? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. So, yeah, Absolutely. keep going and I'll tell you a few more names in a minute. Uh, okay. So, uh, what advice? Oh, Richard Shot. Yeah. Richard Shotton. I always like a bit of, a bit of crack from Richard Shotton. Um, obviously Rory Sutherland. Mm -hmm. um, I like Michelle Wade. She's very good. And I need one more. What's one more outlier that I really like? I, I follow Elon Musk. I got I always like Musk. So. He's a, he's a legend in lots of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, a question from Tom. Uh, you spend a lot of time talking about how marketing has lost the plot these days and only manages comps. How can marketing teams in different companies regain their influence in pricing product in place? It's a good question. Um, I think getting a decent training so you understand those levers. I think swimming upstream so you manage strategy first and then strategy naturally behooves the control of the four levers. And often I think it's finding a, a, finding a CMO that understands marketing to work underneath. So, you know, the, if you've got a CMO that came from comms, they tend to be comms focused. If you get a CMO that is a proper, proper, you know, uh, CMO and, and gets it, they'll fight for you at a much higher level to enable you to do that. Do you know what I mean? To be able to be the, 
the 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 all rounder that I think most people want want to be as a marketer. You know what I mean? If you take uh, Pete Markey's a good example. He's the chief marketing officer of TSB. Uh-huh. Pete Markey knows about you know all of the different, and he's a good guy to follow on LinkedIn. All of the different challenges, and he's a proper marketer. Working for him, he's going to give you all the joysticks. You know what I mean? So look for the leaders you serve. I think as well. So question from Renee, uh, what should companies and marketing people be talking about right now? And I guess that's quite a broad question. So, uh, Yeah, but look, the same, the same as ever. Look, the market changes, but the focus doesn't. What's our position? Well, who's our target? What's our position? What's our objectives? And, and that's the conversation. You know, that's what we come back to at the end of the day to strategy. So the market changes but our strategy should still be our focus mm-hmm. yes. okay uh dave and i think this would probably be the same answer actually so but i've started so i'll finish I'm a very um mastermind uh what is the most overlooked thing you've seen when companies try to quote unquote market their own business what are people missing where are they being blind uh, it's market orientation. So I work once a year, I do a big marketing course for S, for SME uh, marketers who tend to be sub 5 million bucks. And what they all struggle with is they don't have market orientation because they've, they've spent their lives designing and building a product and being able to swivel and see it from the point of view of the customer isn't possible for them. And, and the most important lesson in, in mini MBA in marketing or any other program is market orientation. You can't guess what the customer wants. You have to realize that by producing it, you've no idea what it's like to consume it. And therefore you have to do research. But without market orientation, without seeing it from the customer's point of view, you always go wrong. I mean, for example, the word competitor makes no sense, right? If you're market oriented, there aren't any competitors. It's just alternatives. And the competitor that you look at is, is always the one that looks like you. When you swivel, you realize, oh, fuck, the, the real alternative here is a completely different offer in a different category. You see what I mean? It's a real struggle for people who build their businesses to see that because they're so into the nuts of the product, they can't step out and do that swivel. And that, that I think, is the hardest thing. Yeah, and that was that was actually one of the biggest takeaways I got from the on the contrary talk. Um, so when you break yeah. it down into orientation, strategy, and tactics, um, I actually figured it out. So the the promotion piece in marketing is actually only eight point two five percent of marketing. <laughs> uh, it's, it's right. <laughs> so um, that, I rounded up. I rounded down to eight, but you're absolutely right, Joe. It's only it's eight point two five percent. That's how much of the time we should spend on marketing content. That's it. Um, so um, on on that on that piece actually uh, the market orientation piece because I think it is something that we don't spend a lot of time on. Um, what's your approach? You know, a very high level to beginning a process of market orientation. And do you have any opinions on stuff like I don't know focus groups and stuff like that? Because it feels like that's- <coughs> no, it's it's different. So I, I see the researchers' phase too, right? So market orientation is really more of a vacuum in your head as a marketer. You don't know what the right price is. You can't judge products. And in the company, it's we've studied market orientation for 40 years. We know how to measure it. We know we can correlate more amounts of market orientation with more profit, with more growth, better product success. So it's a really, it's a really well-studied thing. But at a managerial level, market orientation is knowing that you don't know anything. That's the discipline. So if I show you an ad or a price, market orientation, which you do see from good marketers, well-trained marketers, is I don't know what you're asking me for. Mm-hmm. We make the thing, right? How's this talk going? I don't fucking know. I'm, I'm helping deliver it with you. Mm-hmm. The punter will decide. And if you know that, if you know that it's not what you think, it's what the consumer thinks, you open a vacuum. And then you fill that vacuum with research. Now, when it comes to research, I'm open. I like a mix of qual and quant um, because they do different things epistemologically. And I like it to be done once a year properly to to drive a marketing plan. But my point is always without market orientation, the research doesn't do its job because either you don't do it or you don't listen to it. So of all the traits of a good marketer, 
training them in market orientation at the starting point is probably the most important. Sure. And I, I think that's probably, uh, we did a bit of primary research with the marketing meetup and, and we found that um, when in the, in the agency sort of client relationship, the, client relationship. the thing that mm. most agencies value more than anything is implementation. So I think there's almost like an education piece that this stuff like the orientation, the strategy is absolutely vital if you're actually going to get these tactics right. Um, so I just find yeah. that really interesting, but it's the bit everyone misses. No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've taught with, you know, all really good professors who taught really well and ones that were abysmal. Mm -hmm. And the difference uh, is not research because everybody in business school gets the same amount of feedback telling them how shit or good they are. The difference is whether professors give a fuck about the customer and what they think. And, and the answer is, you know, some do and some don't. And the ones that do get better and the ones that don't, stay shit you know and they, that's it that is a key point absolutely right so we've got three minutes so two questions i reckon um so top one the top one uh is from maddie she says should clients be spending on marketing which i think we said yes uh what advice would you give to agencies who are experiencing pausing all advertising during covid19 how would you move from an agency's point of view to navigate a full-blown marketing freeze? I think you have to argue respectfully with the client that keeping the brand light on is smarter than turning it off and trying to turn it back on later. The clients I work with at the moment, even some that are in freeze mode, my argument is, let's say I've got a client that intends to spend $10 million on advertising this year, but only when you know, the market opens up again. My argument to them is, it's better to spend two million of it now, keeping the brand lit up, particularly when everyone else has gone quiet and will get good value for money, and then having eight later than pushing all 10 off to a later point. And I think that's an argument that, again, if you look at the research we talked about earlier, you can make a strong argument for. So I think it's about keeping the brand light on, the long-term value of marketing, um, and arguing with them that actually there, there, there's very good research on the fact that existing campaigns are working just as well now as they were pre-COVID. Just keep your, keep, your, keep your comms out there and maintain salience, even if it's with a lesser budget. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how would you do that with a client? Show them the historical data we talked about earlier. It's incredibly persuasive. Sure. There's, um... There's a nice question here from Alex, which I, I think we'll end on, um, which is it, he's saying that it's starting to feel like there's a, a quote unquote new normal emerging. Um, but actually just a normal coming back. Um, how can marketing help stop the hysteria? And I guess that's a question that relates to um, not only meeting the needs of the customer, but also taking a, a sort of a leadership position Without. Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's a really hard one because normally we do research to stay realistic. But at the moment, research is consumers are scared and confused. And what we're getting back from research is not actually indicative of the future. Um, Edelman's did this ridiculously stupid question, which Ernst and Young almost replicated last week, which is, you know, on the long lines of, do you think the way brands are behaving now? will influence the way you buy from them in the future. And everyone's like, yeah, definitely. You know, and it's just a fucking bullshit question. So I think it's really tricky. And the, I mean, what I've been doing with clients wrong or right is taking them back to January or February research and going at some point we will get back to this because I don't believe that what we're seeing right now in, in consumer responses is an accurate predictor of what will happen down the track. Um, the, the recession, I mean, look, we know recession is coming. So private label will go up and budgets will go down. But I think, you know, it's very tricky because if we use research right now from the market, it does look like the world is is turning to, to piss, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a tricky time for that reason. It is unprecedented. I think we just have to be um, we have to use history as a precedent. Right. I used the um, mad cow disease. I use September the 11th in America. During those periods, there was not there was not as long a period, but a significant period where everyone thought the world was going to totally fucking change. 
And then we went back to cheeseburgers and beer. I, 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 I totally believe that will happen again. I take the point that this crisis is longer. Sweet. Fabulous. So look, there's 137 questions still open. What I'm going to do is uh, make a note of them and, and, and we'll pass them on. But, you know, Mark's done an insane favour here by spending an hour with us. So just thank you very much uh, for spending My this pleasure. time. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, just a, a note once again to sort of say, please do take the time to thank the sponsors. That's the kind of thing that keeps the... Uh, the lights on. Uh, those are Mark's Here's dogs. Here's a picture of my dogs. <laughs> I've got my dog presently sat by my feet. Put yours, in. put yours in, Joe. Go on, put yours in. It's the Dog Lovers Club, mate. Put you, put yours. You're, you've got a posh dog, though. Yours yours looks like it's quite expensive. Uh, you, yeah, I've got him as my... Uh... Oh, wait. This is Zoom changing. My, my, mine, are, um, mine are both rescue dogs from Tasmania. Oh, there's yours. That's great. Hang on, I'll go back to yours. Yeah, yours looks like it's yeah, that looks like a posh dog, mate. That looks lovely. Oh, yeah, that's handsome. Uh, that's but, Eric. So, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Asia, Asia, my big white dingo lab cross, she'd, she'd love him for breakfast, she really would. <laughs> he's a, yeah, he's a village dog. Um, <laughs> but yeah, thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. And uh, on that note, from uh, from me and from Eric, uh, Take care of yourself, everyone. Stay safe, everyone, and stay sexy. Nice one. Cheers. Take care.